I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand, they do have some really appealing properties where you can explain certain types of correlations that we observe, like as a matter of fact, we can explain them very easily. But on the theoretical side, they don't seem to work properly. Thank you very much. We all know the story of Newton framing his theory of gravity as a result of watching an apple fall from a tree. But 350 years on, we still don't understand this seemingly simple force. So current theories cannot apply both at the small scale of atomic particles and at the giant scale of galaxies, or on the scale of quantum mechanics and on the scale of general relativity. Without a solution, the mystery of gravity threatens to undermine any overall account of the universe. Now, is the fault for this with Einstein's theory of general relativity or with our understanding of quantum mechanics? Do we need an entirely different account of gravity or perhaps remove gravity from our explanations altogether? Or should we just accept that a single holistic account of the universe is not possible and see our theories as limited to a given frame and reference? So I'm delighted to be on stage here as a philosopher of science with three of the world's top physicists. We have a fantastic panel for you. Sabina Hossenfelter is a physicist who specializes in the foundations of physics. Uh, she is the host of the YouTube channel Science Without the Gobbledygook, which I believe just reached one million subscribers. Uh, Priya Natarayan uh, is a professor of astronomy and physics at Yale University, whose research is on the dark universe. She is the author of the pioneering work, Mapping the Heavens, the Radical Scientific Cosmos. Eric Verlinda, to my left, is a theoretical physicist and string theorist. He is famous for the Verlinda formula and winner of the Spinoza Prize. Eric is developing his own radical theory of gravitation. So welcome to the panelists and to all of you for being present. So we begin by the simple question, can we solve the mysteries of gravity and if so, how? So for this, I invite uh, Sabina to begin. Thank you, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's always good to be in London. So since I'm the first to get to say something, I want to say a little more about the problem that we're talking about in the first place. So we have, we know of four different fundamental forces in physics. That's the electromagnetic force that most of you have probably heard of. Then we have the strong and weak nuclear force and we have gravity. And the problem is that three of those forces, the electromagnetic and the two nuclear forces have quantum properties. So we have some particles like electrons and quarks and gluons, stuff like this. And we know that they do funny things, like they obey the uncertainty principle, they can be in two places at the same time, that kind of weird stuff. And then there's gravity, which is described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, and that theory doesn't know anything about quantum properties. And this brings up the question, if I have a particle like an electron that can be in two places at the same time, and it has a mass, and that mass generates a gravitational pull. Where does the gravitational pull go? You'd expect that to also go to two places at the same time, but Einstein's theory can't make that work because it doesn't know anything about quantum properties. So this leaves us in this weird position where we just don't know what the gravitational pull of an electron is. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really simple question, like what's going on with the gravitational field of the, this electron? And we don't know. And um, if you ask like more technically, uh, what's the matter? It's just that those two theories, the quantum field theories that we use to describe particles, uh, like the electron and a couple of other particles, and Einstein's theory of general relativity, they're just mathematically incompatible. If we just put them together, it doesn't work. But nature knows how it works. So there's got to be a solution to this. Uh, and we don't know what it is. And there have been many people who've tried to solve this problem. What we need is a theory of quantum gravity. So a theory that gives properties to gravity at least that's the way that it's normally put, but more generally, we need some way to resolve this 
discrepancy between the two theories. And the probably best known approach to this is string theory that most of you will have heard of. There are other ideas like uh, loop quantum gravity, and then there are less well-known ones like maybe asymptotically safe uh, gravity and stuff like this. But so far, we don't know if any of those is correct uh, or how we can even test them. And yes, I think it's a really big problem. Now, when it comes to my personal opinion on what to do, as I just said, like people have worked on this problem for a long time. It's been known since the 1930s or something, so it's definitely not a new thing. And there are lots of smart people have spent their whole life trying to fix something that they think is wrong with gravity. And I have a lot of respect for all those people, and if they couldn't make it work, I'm pretty sure I can't make it work either. So this is why I think it's a better strategy to try and figure out if not there's something wrong with the quantum side of things, that the problems may be caused by us not understanding what quantization means in the first place. Excellent. Uh, Eric? Yes, uh, can we understand the mysteries of gravity? I do think that Newton and already Einstein know a lot. I mean, they describe a lot about gravity that, well, they solved partly the mystery of gravity. But we are now a century further, and we are need have to think about how to combine this theory that uh, Einstein wrote down, general relativity, with what we know about the microscopic world, the quantum mechanics. And indeed, we are learning that uh, we may have to rethink uh, gravity again and try to understand uh, where it comes from, but basically what are the foundations of what, what gravity is. And the way we have been approaching this, and, and just not just me, but, but many scientists in the world, is by thinking about places in our universe where indeed things break down from, from relativity. So these are places like near black holes. Uh, black holes turned out to have uh, what are called horizons, uh, beyond which light cannot escape. And, and Stephen Hawking, I think everyone knows him, of course, is famous for discovering that when you combine general relativity with quantum mechanics, that there are special things happening near horizons. And when we take his results and his, his scientific breakthroughs basically seriously, they tell us that we should indeed rethink gravity, maybe think about how to understand it from a more microscopic uh, perspective. So my answer to the question is, should we change general relativity or quantum mechanics? I would say that, that uh, the way I approach this, and actually many of my colleagues, is that we take quantum mechanics as a working theory and then try to understand how the microscopic description of space and time, which sort of directly related to what, what gravity is, uh, how, how that leads to the gravitational force. So we like to understand the origin of gravity at a more uh, deeper level. So I would say the problem of quantum gravity is not how do we apply quantum mechanics to gravity, but how do we understand where gravity comes from, from a quantum uh, theory that's, that's underlying it. So I will, I will be saying more about this uh, later, but my answer indeed is, well, we can understand better what gravity is. I think we have already a very good description, but we can make a next step by thinking more about, uh, well, the, the connection with quantum mechanics. Okay, excellent. So Priya, can we solve the mysteries of gravity? And if so, how? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that we can solve the mysteries of um, uh, gravity. And I think that um, I agree with both Sabina and Eric that, um, you know, what we are aspiring to is sort of uh, synthetic description of gravity that combines a microscopic view with a macroscopic view. Einstein's theory of general relativity has been incredibly successful so far in the settings that we've been able to test it, right? So in my opinion, the new theory, and we know Einstein's theory is incomplete. We know that already. The question is, how do we complete it and what will show us the way? And data will show us the way, right? I think, um, more accurate data sets, precision measurements in the cosmos that actually test the limits of uh, Einstein's theory are the way forward, I think. Because I believe, if you look at the history of science, look at the history of ideas in, um, in um, theories of gravity, it's really data that leads the way, that opens up. Do you see a gap in a current description? 
And there are multiple data sets, multiple independent lines of evidence that show you that there is a gap. This, uh, there, is, there are data that are not explained within the current framework, and that kind of leads you and shows you the way. And you know, if you look at Newton's theory versus GR, for example, although Einstein didn't set out to solve the problem, you know, when the uh, orbit of Uranus could not really be explained fully with, you know, Newtonian description, um, there was a lot of panic, right? And they thought, oh my God, this sacred theory, do we have to give it up already? It turns out that the solution was within Newtonian gravity itself, right? That there was a perturber, there was Neptune. The location of Neptune was predicted and it was found. So um, similarly, uh, and so the theory just had to be modified. You didn't have to overthrow the theory. Meanwhile, when Mercury's, the perihelion precession of Mercury could not be explained, uh, there was no adjustment. You know, you couldn't, there were suggestions that maybe there was another planet, maybe there was Vulcan that was in between the sun and Mercury, but that's not a, that was not a, that didn't work as a solution, right? So something else was needed. You couldn't tweak Newtonian gravity to explain that. And you needed Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity to actually describe uh, and account for the observation. So we were able to do this because we were able to get more precise uh, observations, more accurate data over longer times. So I really believe that data will lead the way and that we already know that Einstein's theory is incomplete and we do expect a reconciliation between the microscopic and the macroscopic. Okay, so we have uh, three divergent positions on the same problem. Uh, let's try to dig into a little bit more of the core of the debate. So we move on now to the first theme, which has already been outlined from the start. Does the fault lie in our theory of, with the theory of gravity, lie with Einstein's theory of relativity? or with the current interpretations of quantum mechanics? And I'd like to invite Sabina to elaborate on this question and your own view first. Okay, so um, I don't think the issue is with the interpretation of quantum mechanics. I actually think we do need a better theory than quantum mechanics. And the reason I think this is that, um, I mean, maybe let me first say, I, I agree with Priya that uh, data has to lead the way because this is science, right? So uh, we need to observe something and then try to explain it. And I think the same is true for quantum gravity. Eventually, we'll need some kind of some kind of observation that we'll have to explain. But the question is, where do we look? <laughs> and for this, you need some kind of theoretical approach that says that's what we need to look for. This is what we need to test. So um, just because data <laughs> eventually will be the decisive factor doesn't mean we can just uh, get rid of uh, theorists, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so and and the reason well, we definitely don't want to be out of business, theorists, <laughs> right? I mean, our jobs will be in jeopardy if we had throw theory out, right? <laughs> right. So uh, we need both, basically, um, theory and observation. Um, now, the issue with quantum theory is that uh, this quantization of gravity isn't the only problem. We also have what's called the measurement problem of quantum mechanics, which is pretty much as old as uh, quantum mechanics itself. So it's even older than the problem of quantum gravity. And the issue with uh, the measurement is that we just don't know how it works. So if we use quantum mechanics, we make a measurement, we just say, and now a measurement happens. <laughs> That's like, and now a miracle happens, <laughs> and everything changes, and here's our measurement result. And so we, we know how to apply this theory in the laboratory because we know a measurement when we see one, but we can't explain what it is. And I think that this problem is going to become more and more important now that we're building quantum computers and all kinds of, you know, quantum measurement devices, quantum sensing and, and, and all that kind of thing. So this is where I think the data is going to come from. They'll stumble over it sooner or later, whether they want to or not. Your own work on quantum gravity, would you give the audience a very brief explanation on how to understand or conceptualize quantum gravity in this context? The debate. 
Yeah, well, okay. So, <laughs> you know, um, when, when, you, when we talked about the introduction that we, you would give, uh, I had him strike out the word theoretical in front of uh, physicists because I don't really understand myself as a theoretical physicist. I work on phenomenology. And this is what I've worked on when it comes to quantum gravity. I've worked on the phenomenology. The reason I don't call myself a phenomenologist is that no one knows what it means. So, uh, so, so what it means is that we're trying to make a connection between theoretical approaches and how you can make an, an experiment. And that in quantum gravity, I've tried to figure out what we can do to test it. So physicists like to tell a long story about how we can't test quantum gravity ever. And if that was true, I would have said, well, then it's not science. Why even think about it? But I don't think it's true. And the major reason I don't think it's true is that we don't necessarily need strong gravity to test quantum gravity, which is what a lot of people seem to think, like we need a black hole or we need to look at the origin of the universe or something like this. What we actually need is we need some kind of quantum object that's massive enough so that we can measure the gravitational field. Because think about what I told you in the beginning. We don't know what the gravitational field is of an electron. Why not take something more massive? Well, because normally more massive things, they don't have quantum properties, so we can't measure this effect. But this is another thing where there's a lot of progress in the technological development. They're bringing more and more massive objects into quantum states, and at some point we'll just be able to measure it. Priya, do you agree that it's uh, quantum mechanics that needs to catch up with theory of gravity that's more established? Well, I mean, I'm actually agnostic about who needs to catch up with whom. I think it, the question is they're not reconcilable at the moment. They're not, you know, you can't integrate them at the moment. You know, I, I prefer a slightly safer approach, which is why don't we see uh, how far we can push the general uh, theory of uh, relativity and see where it breaks? Because I really believe that the gaps and where the theory breaks really points out, as Sabina said, right, the the quantum gravity, the quantum nature of macroscopic objects, lots of thorny problems there. So this is in many ways a slightly easier route I would take, which is, and I really believe that um, very soon we'll be able to push much further than we already have uh, in, in terms of tests of general relativity, especially in the strong regime. So when you're testing general relativity, the Event Horizons uh, Telescope, for example, you know, this is the telescope that produced the donut-shaped image of this uh, black hole in the center of a nearby galaxy. So that allowed us to test the predictions of uh, general relativity at a few percent level, and we can push down. And I firmly believe that because I think that the theory isn't complete, it is going to break. And I think we are similarly at, uh, you know, technologically, in terms of instrumentation, computation, modeling, and understanding, we're at a place where we can get more accurate measurements and we can test the theory to greater precision. And I believe that it will break and that that break will show us what the next step really should be. So my approach would be sort of contra to Sabina's to say that maybe we already know GR is incomplete, so let's kind of push it with the data because we know we can articulate the experiments. It's sort of the, as I said, it's, it's a more sort of cautious way out um, and perhaps an easy way out because we know how to set up these experiments. We know the limits of our experiments. And therefore, if we can push harder and make more precise observations and test the theory to the sub percent level, maybe that's where we'll see where we need to go next. Okay, so Eric, what do you make of these approaches that are data will lead the way and, and so on? They, they are important, uh, but I, I think that, well, from my perspective, I come from the theory side. I do call myself a theoretical physicist, and I like to also say, like, take theory as a leading uh, guide to which of the two should be changed. And there I already mentioned the, the important work of, of Stephen Hawking and his collaborators. 
uh, which is actually about a point where general relativity may break yeah. down, namely near the horizons of black holes. And even in, in our universe, we have a, a horizon where things may be, break down. And there you notice that, that the laws of gravity actually becomes to look like what we call are the laws of thermodynamics. Those are laws that apply to gases and, and molecules that are forming a gas and they only describe everything in terms of temperature. In the case of Hawking, this is the Hawking temperature, but also notions like entropy and maybe pressure. But those are, are things that we understand from a microscopic level because of the molecules that make up the gas. They're, they're basically statistical properties of all the motions of the molecules. Now, it turns out that the gravitational equations look exactly like that. The, and this is also what we're trying to look for, is namely a, an explanation of what the laws of gravity look like, as Newton and Einstein wrote down, but then explained from the, the microscopic set of molecules, say, of space and time. And we, we are making progress there, because we have been able to think about black holes really as quantum mechanical objects where we can basically derive uh, the gravitational laws just like we can de derive these, these uh, laws of thermodynamics. And so from the theory side, it's, it's I would say, almost obvious that, that the thing that has to change is the, 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 the description of gravity in terms of general relativity and that we have to get a, a deeper understanding of that. But eventually, of course, we have to take the theory and see what it implies also for observations. And this is where I think it's exciting that there are these uh, new observations of, well, the Event Horizon Telescope, but also gravitational waves, what happens near black holes. But also in the cosmos, when we look further out and more into the past, there are questions we don't fully understand, like what is, well, things like uh, dark energy or things that make the universe expand faster. There are all kinds of questions associated to that that, uh, well, we, we have to then answer. Uh, using a, a new perspective on this uh, quantum gravity theory. And so the way I think about quantum gravity is that we combine quantum mechanics, we start from quantum mechanics and we leave it as it is, and then explain what, what the laws of gravity are and how we can then derive uh, general relativity from this more microscopic theory. Okay, so Eric represents a different approach and let's now move uh, a little bit further into the next theme, which will elaborate a bit more on this. So the, the question here really is whether we need an entirely different account of gravity, or perhaps do we need to remove gravity from our explanations altogether, which is something Eric has previously suggested. Uh, Priya, what is your take on this question? Well, I mean, I think we, um, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard for me to see how we could remove gravity entirely from our frame of descriptions of the physical universe, especially given that, um, we really do understand that over the largest cosmic scales, gravity is what appears to be ordering the universe, right? So I think throwing out gravity completely, I think is not an option. I think the option is to find uh, perhaps, you know, a, a more refined description of what gravity is. Um, and um, I concur with Eric that the, the theory will direct us to what the best experimental setups are. Whether, um, but I, I, but I think that you know, again, you know, we need to push general relativity. We need to think up of new realms. We know that the strong gravity regime is where we are likely to see departures from general relativity, and I think we need more innovative ideas of other regimes where you could actually test. So I, I believe that an alternate new description is in order because I think when we look at the current general relativistic description of the universe and its constituents, there are many open questions and there is a standard theory that seems to work reasonably well across a wide range of scales. And I'm referring to all these dark entities, right? Dark matter, um, you know, uh, dark energy, uh, and sort of the entire cosmic inventory. But there are cracks that are starting to appear from data, very interesting and important cracks that are starting to appear that sort of show that maybe this frame, that maybe we are missing something in this frame. And 
as I said, it's too early to tell whether some tweak in the current theory can accommodate these cracks that we're seeing, or we need something really brand new. I mean, I like to believe that um, we, of course, need to be always open to something brand new. But I think the number of cracks that are starting, so there are many of these what are called crises in cosmology that are starting to show up. So there's a you know, problem with the uh, measurements of the Hubble constant in the near universe, far universe. So it's sort of reconciling distance scales is becoming an issue. And I think it points to the fact that we can't dispense with gravity, but we probably need a new kind of explanation. Indeed, and there are uh, many cracks that are appearing nowadays and that is uh, reframing a bit of the debate in cosmology, uh, which makes it pertinent this kind of question about where gravity fits into the, into the picture. Uh, Sabina, do you uh, agree that there is, that you, what do you make of this idea that we could come up with a description that would remove gravity altogether? Or um, would you think there's a, an entirely different account of gravity that's possible? Well, I would just like to try to clarify uh, the trend that this discussion has taken. Because we started out talking about quantum gravity, and now you say, well, we should push the boundaries of general relativity, looking at astrophysics, black holes, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's true, of course, that we do have problems with general relativity looking out in the cosmos, because we don't really understand what's going on with, with galaxies, why do they rotate so fast, what's going on with galaxy clusters, uh, why does the universe why does the expansion of the universe accelerate? This is why we've introduced those, those things called dark matter and dark energy. But those are different problems than the ones that we started out with, like the ones with the quantization of gravity. And they might be related or they might not be related. So um, I see the problem that you might, you know, you, you might test the boundaries of general relativity looking at uh, black holes, uh, whatever, but the solution to those problems might not require actually fixing the problem of the quantization of gravity. It might just be that we have to modify gravity um, or there is a more complicated dark matter model, uh, that kind of thing. Now, when it comes to throwing out gravity, I think that question is somewhat of a red herring because we, we know that general relativity is a great theory. <laughs> Certainly, we're not going to throw it out. That would be <laughs> madness. But what might happen is that we might find an underlying theory from which it can be derived. For example, string theory uh, is one of those candidates, but it might be something else. And then we would say, well, gravity is emergent from something else. Um, and it, must, it doesn't have to be string theory. It could be some other atoms of space time or things like that. Eric, is uh, yeah, so gravity a red herring? No, I understand. So gravity is something that we experience, mm -hmm. so we need to have an explanation. Mm -hmm. Well, we first can accept that it's there and then we can describe it, but an explanation might also be that you start from a theory where you don't assume gravity from the beginning. And then you start looking at what happens when, when we start describing physical objects and what space and time are, and then we discover that gravity is a natural consequence of that theory. And sort of uh, just like uh, what I mentioned for, for the laws of thermodynamics of gases and so on, uh, if I look at an individual molecule, uh, temperature doesn't mean anything. It's the molecules together that give us the impression of a temperature because they, they together move and then by having a, a large number of molecules, these laws become make sense. So this is what we also call emergence. The ter term was, was already mentioned, namely that you start from a microscopic theory and then describe what happens when you combine, well, go to larger distances, for instance, and then gravity can appear. So I think that microscopically the world doesn't care about gravity, but of course we need to explain what it is. So it's not like we can ignore that there is gravity, it is there and we need to have a theory for it. And general relativity works very well. So you might say, well, we have to understand where general relativity comes from. But I also believe that, that there may be circumstances that the theory that we may derive from the microscopic perspective may be different from general relativity. And those circumstances can be also in, in galaxies or, or in the cosmos. And then, well, you mentioned Mercury as a, a problem and that Newton-Neptune was sort of, in other cases, a solution. Maybe dark matter is a similar uh, discrepancy that we try to sort of solve by adding things 
And I think that indeed uh, we have to take those measurements and these observations seriously as also maybe indications that there may be something wrong with the theory of gravity and not just that there may be some particles that we haven't found. Absolutely. That is really what I was alluding to, that the uh, more uh, accurate, high-precision measurements may actually show you that a gap in the theory, in the theoretical description, not just a fix like Neptune, where you add in another degree of freedom and you're able to explain within the current framework itself. Yes. So from a philosophical and theoretical point of view, you could say this, this would make, seem to make sense as an approach to uh, widen the frame so as to make the problem appear in a different light. But uh, Sabina, from a physics point of view, um, do you find this approach uh, useful to pursue or are there problems with this way of reframing the problem to get, eliminate gravity? Well, she was just talking about modifying gravity, not eliminating gravity. Yeah. <laughs> I think we shouldn't left anything untried, basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, personally, I think there's been too much time and effort spent on trying to come up with all kinds of different dark matter particles. You know, there are gazillions of those models, and they all make more or less the same predictions, and then you can adjust them to slightly fit this type of galaxy a little bit better, or that kind of... And it didn't really go anywhere because the model is just too, it's too flexible. And there are very obvious correlations in, in the data, as you certainly uh, know, like, for example, the baryonic Tully fissure relation, that kind of stuff, which dark matter just can't explain. And there are other modifications of gravity that explain those things, but then they have different problems. <laughs> so it becomes really complicated. And I generally think it's not good to um, put our bets on one thing. So um, I, I'm really supportive of spending some time on modified gravity and different approaches to that kind of thing. Uh, spending some time on the idea of trying to replace gravity or explain it as something emergent or induced gravity. It is a similar but related idea. Or maybe just saying maybe the thought is with uh, the quantum side of things, which is what, what I uh, personally work on. Okay, so there we have three different approaches to this that you're outlining. Is the modified gravity is one way to go. There's this emergent picture of trying to reframe the idea of gravity to begin with. And then you have quantum gravity. So to the three deba uh, debaters here, if you had to place your bets, Priya, on either I mean, of these. You say you're agnostic, but if you had to put some, if I gave you some chips now, you had to put them down on so the So what are the, what's the third option? So I think modifying gravity just with a view to adding um, additional degrees of freedom, but stay within the same framework where other cracks are opening up is clearly not, that's not where I would put my bet. But not little tweaks to the theory, but push it so that the cracks to try to make sense of all these crises. So the modifying gravity so far has been really focused on the dark matter problem. So new, and I think I said point, uh, new zoos of particles, right? Alternative particles. I think that is an, that's an approach that has been tried. A lot of energy has been spent. And I think it's, it's, it's been useful. It's taught us more, but that's not where I would put my bet on. The kind of uh, pushing the theory that I'm talking about is actually trying to see these crises, you know, going beyond just having a different kind of dark matter particle. I think that's where things are pushing us. Fundamentally look at the nature of dark energy and what we think dark energy is, for example. And then fundamentally looking at whether these conceptual ideas of dark matter and dark energy can somehow be, I mean, could they be two manifestations of the same thing. I mean, you know, I think those kinds of ideas are totally worth exploring. And I think they should be, and not as much attention is being paid to them. We've been uh, spending too much, uh, so I would not bet on the modifying gravity. And I said, with the quantum, um, with the quantum theory of gravity, I think that there's just like vast bits of things that we don't understand. So as a pragmatist, I would stick to sort of my view of uh, really pushing the theory of general relativity with the view of finding a replacement theory for it. And I firmly believe that we will see new directions. But Sabina, this approach to modified gravity, which has, been, uh, which has come to the fore a lot in the last five to 10 years, it's really um, gained a lot of uh, 
interest and a lot of research uh, in the field. I know you have also engaged a lot with that field. Do you see it as Priya is suggesting here more that it's limited kind of tinkering with the existing model? Or do you think that there's a real promise in a kind of a breakthrough with understanding modified gravity? Well, as you say, I've actually worked on modified gravity for a couple of years, and uh, I used to think it's really promising. It's going to solve all, this, all these problems, and I don't work on it anymore because it turned out it doesn't work quite right. as well as I thought it would. It's like from a theoretical side, it's really, really difficult to make those theories work. And, you know, I'm of two minds about this. On the one hand, they do have some really appealing properties where you can explain certain types of correlations that we observe, like as a matter of fact, we can explain them very easily. But on the theoretical side, they don't seem to work properly. So, and this, I, I think I, I'm afraid I actually agree with you. It just <laughs> makes me feel yeah, like we're missing something really big. Yeah. Like there's something fundamentally wrong with this type of theory because they don't work. With the, the mathematics doesn't work the way that we expect it to work. Especially light deflection. I think one of the big, you know, I was open-minded like um, Sabina, I dabbled a little less uh, because, you know, I'm invested in light detection, uh, gravitational lensing. Those theories are unable to provide a description. And we see these lenses. We see these arcs. Hubble Space Telescope has shown us these arcs, right? So, yeah, well, well so. There, are, there are models which can explain that kind of thing, but then they have other problems. So it's like you're pushing around the bump under the carpet. You know, it always comes up somewhere. So Eric, where would you place your chips? Well, uh, someone said, I mean, don't modify gravity, but try to understand it. Yeah. And I think that's my approach is I want to understand gravity and then find answers. And maybe I should mention it here more, more clearly, there has been a lot of progress made in our field in understanding gravity that comes from string theory. We have a theory that explains gravity microscopically. The only drawback is that it's not yet in a universe that looks like our own. It's namely one where there's no dark energy that makes things a lot simpler. So the step that we need to make as theorists eventually is to develop this theory that we understand very well, but in a context where there is dark energy. And there I feel that we can indeed understand gravity to the level where we can do computations and make descriptions that clarify these, these observations, not by modifying it, but by really understanding what gravity is. To make clear, so I think it's, it's starting from quantum mechanics and then deriving gravity again. And maybe I should mention that, I mean, Newton had a theory of gravity Einstein didn't modify exactly. the yeah. equation of Newton. He had a much better, much deeper understanding. So the, the, because he, he combined it with space and time and everything, a curvature of space and time, a totally new perspective. And I think our next theory of gravity will again not be a modification of the, the laws of Newton or, or the Einstein equations. No, it will be a totally new perspective that will be given on what gravity is. What do you see as the problem with this approach, uh, Sabina? Do you see a problem with it or um, what Eric is outlining? No. Um, for me, the question comes down to, like, strategically, what's the kind of experiment that we should look at to test those kinds of ideas? And as I was trying to say earlier, I think if you look at astrophysics, cosmology, all those kind of big scale questions, it becomes basically impossible to tear apart the problems with dark matter, dark energy, uh, modified gravity, quantum gravity. And then let's not forget there might be other problems, like with uh, the kind of model that we use in general relativity. They might just be too simple, or there might be issues with the numerical simulations. You know, they're, they're you know, just on the numerical side or because we're neglecting some kind of feedback or subgrid parameters and all kinds of things. So this is why I'm thinking it would be strategically much better if we looked at something clean, like this kind of tabletop experiment where we're trying to put those masses into some kind of uh, superpositions. And I understand that Priya disagrees because she thinks that's... I think that's, that's much more complex, much more actually, <laughs> coming up with those experiments because quantum mechanics is so complicated. Um, yeah. 
Well, these are, uh, I mean, very different kinds of approaches. Let's, uh, let's uh, move to the last theme and try to put this in a bigger frame again, um, a little bit. Uh, also really more philosophically, should we just accept that a single holistic account of the universe is not possible? Should we see our theories as inevitably just limited to a given time and a given reference and accept them as working within that range only? Eric, would you like to begin? Now, I do think that we can make a, a next step in understanding gravity, whether it's the final understanding. I don't think that as humans we can understand everything about the universe. That's one thing. The other thing that I find quite important is that we also have to realize that we are here at planet Earth looking at the universe out there and that we are doing observations and we have to explain those things in a framework that we invent like space and time and so on. But we are doing it from a certain perspective. So I do think that we should be aware of the fact that we may have an incomplete description of everything. And certainly the edges of the universe may be sort of beyond where we can observe. So I think that in our current theories, we have um, not enough taken into account that we are making our observations from a certain perspective. And maybe our description of what we call the universe should also be more, well, from our own uh, reference frame. And because you used that word in your question. I mean, I do think that we have to take into account that there's a certain observer dependence of how we interpret what we are uh, looking. Mm -hmm. But Priya, is it possible to have a single holistic account or are we just limited the way we are? I, I, I think we could aspire to it. Yeah. Um, and I think I concur with Eric on this point that uh, from a sense of sort of cosmic humility, right? There's no reason why the brain, the size of a gelatinous thing, the size of a cantaloupe, should be able to comprehend everything in the universe, including itself. So I believe that there are limits, but I think it is worth uh, aspiring to. And we may yet get to a fundamentally different description that feels more complete than what we have right now, which okay. we know is incomplete. Yeah. Sabina, would you agree? Well, I certainly agree that we should aspire to, you know, finding uh, an overarching holistic account of everything, uh, but I'm not sure we need one. So when, when it comes to this particular question, like, can we just make do with what we have, like with um, GR and, and quantum theory? I think the answer is clearly no, because as I said in the beginning, there are just questions that we can't answer. And sooner or later, we're going to have a situation in a laboratory where the theorists can just say, well, we don't know. We don't have the theory. So we need this theory. So we need a theory of quantum uh, gravity. Now, do we, do we need a unified theory of everything, that kind of stuff, which string theory is aspiring to? I'm not sure about this. You know, I guess it would be nice, but it's not really necessary. <laughs> <laughs> So if I had an apple in my hand, or you imagine this is an apple, I would do like this. This is how we started. We all know uh, gravity is an experiential force. Like we all feel it, but we don't know entirely what it is. Now we have three of the brightest minds working on this problem on, uh, here on stage. And I'd like to just ask you a simple question. When you are, it could be a question from either of you, anyone asking you, Priya, what is gravity? Oh gosh. Uh <laughs> Hmm. Uh, I think it's very hard for me, as you probably all guessed, I'm trapped within Einsteinian theory of general relativity. So um, um, I would probably uh, defer to that kind of, you know, it's a profound confluence of space and time that illuminates the nature of a very fundamental force that orders the visible and invisible universe. Confluence of space and time that orders our universe. And as I said, I'm pretty trapped by Einstein still, right? So I think uh, I haven't broken out of the box, although I'm open to and I want to break out of the box. Yeah. Okay, Eric, what is gravity? Well, just to introduce this, I mean, the, the way we try to understand gravity now is by thinking about more microscopically what space and time is made of and then we use words like information especially also the, the quantum information you have to think about things like what you have on your computer like data and so on 
but space-time is also filled with that information. And gravity, I have has actually written down somewhere, uh, is then a consequence of moving information around. So it's the cost mm -hmm. of moving information. Okay, so and that would be a microscopic explanation of where it comes from. So gravity is a consequence of moving information viewed microscopically. That's right. Okay, interesting. Sabina, what is gravity? <laughs> so I, I have to be on another panel later today where I'm supposed to answer the question, what's a particle? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is why I've actually thought about this question. I came to the answer that I don't think this is a question for science. I would say what we do in science is we describe observations. So I can tell you what we use to describe the effect that we call gravity. We describe it with a curved differential manifold uh, of dimension four that has Lorentzian signature. And to me, that's a satisfactory answer. That, that's, that's what I would say it is. Uh, I'm just afraid that most people wouldn't understand what it means. So does that mean uh, we don't need to know what it is as a physicist? Right, we just have to explain what we observe. We accept it as a given. It is something we work with to try to calculate or... Yeah, so from a pragmatic perspective, we just need no, I think, mathematical... I think we are both saying something. So like we have an operational definition that we think works and we're happy with it. Well, it works more or less. Yeah, <laughs> yes. more or less, yes. Okay, three different uh, takes on gravity. So gravity is kind of special. And I think with that, we have to let this debate <laughs> fall to the ground. I really want to thank the amazing thank speakers, Priya, Eric, and Sabina. The podcast talks, debates, courses, and articles. Visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv